Green tea is popular, eh? Yeah. Oh, hello! Hello! Welcome! A few of you coming in still, so we'll just kind of hold I'll off. Prop, let me prop the door open. Yeah. <laughs> come on in, come on in, come on in! Um, hello, everyone. How are you? How are you? Really? Everything okay? We're good? Yeah! <laughs> How was last night? I see that some of you are sharing how last night was. Um, and uh, certainly for uh, the American students in the audience, we hope that you are okay um, and that uh, you will be okay. And we are thinking of you and for all of us who have family uh, in the United States who uh, are not um, necessarily American, but uh, who have kind of skin in the game in that in that respect we also hope that you kind are all okay of like the whole world with yeah. skin in the game yeah so you are okay you are okay we hope you are feeling okay yes <laughs> you will be okay it will be okay um yeah interesting and um i think that the thing if you are feeling sort of stressed about the results right now i think the, the world has been preparing itself for a bit of a long haul. So I think we can kind of think about, you know, future show and Alex being stressed out about potentially, but I not right you, now. I bet you future Alex has gorgeous red hair. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. It will be okay in the end. It will be. If it's not okay, it's not the end. It's not the end. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So long, long goal. Um, 2000, I think, was the last time there was a, a bit of a, a delay in all of this. And the hanging chads. The hanging chads. Back those when, were like, just Western students. Paper. <laughs> you got a Western? No. You got a purple um, sweater tied around my neck? Yeah. No, it's possible that this group, or most of this group, uh, wasn't really around for the, nope. the 2000 election. Maybe they were celebratory hanging chad. Uh... Yeah, they were election babies. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, it takes some time and there are all sorts of things like, you know, crests and valleys that can happen until the, uh, announcement is made officially. Um, so oh, hold thank in you. there. What? Thank oh, you for the, the hair. flowing red hair on Smith. That's really good. If you good. Google the phrase, Alex Smith with hair. Oh yeah. You get a photo. You'll probably get some football players. So ignore that guy. Yeah. But eventually you'll see what I'm missing. And you know, that pretty much captures it. Uh, <laughs> it does. There were fewer hearts. But... Okay. Um, so. It was longer. Yeah. Um, yes. So everybody hang on, hang in. Um, and that do something for that, yourself that today. That is our learning outcome for today. Yeah. Hang do on. Something. Hang in. Yeah. Be good to yourself. Be good to somebody else. Then. Yeah. And get outside. I like that that one's a popular one. Make tea. Find non-humans to chat with. Non-humans are like the are best awesome. people to chat with. They're good listeners, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and talk with friends. Super important. Talk with family. Put your phone in the other room. Uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised not a lot of um, people subscribing to like the Netflix or the novel. I suppose yeah. read something escapist, watch something escapist. So I would encourage that. Yeah, there's some good stuff out there. Um, okay. What have you been watching lately? What have I been watching lately? Uh, I finished. Oh, <laughs> I like. Um, I I, I like get to see if this is like the actual answer or no, an answer. No, I, for... I I well, I, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but okay. So I really like zombie movies, and the more violent, the better. I know, like it doesn't it doesn't quite match with my personality, though, does yeah. it? Maybe this is the problem to admit. Like I really like uber violent sci-fi. Um, so lately on all of the subscription shows there, I've kind of run out of stuff. So I did finally get to see the boys, um, uh, which at least for the first few episodes, I, I quite liked, and then it got a little bit ridiculous, but I did, I did get through it. Um, how about you? What are you watching? Bob's Burgers. <laughs> I hate Bob's Burgers. And, um, oh, I also started watching the sequel. Buckle up. Buckle up, buckle up, or you'll die. <laughs> I also did start watching the sequel. Oh, Queen's to the... Gambit. Heard about that. That's supposed to be quite good. Is it violent? Um... Eh, okay. I've been watching also the sequel to The Good Wife, 
um, which is not terrible. Um, I do like the creativity in the uh, cases that they're kind of like working within. And I, th I think, yeah, they're quite good. So anyway, um, that's what we're watching. Please send us recommendations because we're running out of stuff. And I'm just writing a response to somebody who shared the frustration that they feel without time to do this. It is and, violent. And the we Queen's definitely, gambit. we definitely understand what you're saying that there, to do those escapist things takes time. But yeah. uh, take this as a thing from us as old bald people, <laughs> uh, person or gray. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Nobody's ever going to make that time for you. So so you got to learn how to defend it. And yeah. whether it's for like working out or walking or music or whatever, yeah. um, defend that stuff. And oh even yeah, Orphan Black. Orphan, Orphan Black, Black is, is amazing. Good. Yes. Uh, what is Thank Tatiana you. Maslany? She is like she might be playing me right now. In fact, Alter. she be, she could be playing both of us. <laughs> Altered Carbon is good. Yes, no zombies, you're right, but also good. Um, wonderful. Yay. One, oh, Black Summer Zombie An anime series. recommendation, sure. Just Thank you, everyone. There. Okay. Of course, we're just like... Black Mirror. Black Mirror, <laughs> so I think, good. I think everyone was watching that last night. <laughs> it it just, felt like yeah. it. <laughs> um, you know what feels a little bit like Black Mirror lately is the War of the Worlds series. Yeah. With those, like, there's, like, this one Black Mirror episode where there's these, like, running dog-like things that are terrible. Um, yeah. Anyway. It's good. Okay. Awesome. So I'm glad. Okay. okay. Letter Kenny. Please Minnesota. tell me you've seen Train to Bus. Or Train to Busan. Okay, I know, and I'm writing it down. We are living in a Black Ear Maps episode. Yes. That's why Black Train to Busan. Okay. Charlie, what's his face? He's brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> well done. Amazing zombie movie. Oh, yay. Thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Wonderful. Okay. So um, we should start because we soon we'll start. have to go. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we kind of purposely planned a bit of a slower day today. Um, given uh, the fact that it was totally predictable um, what was not going to be announced last night. Um, so that's why we, we may seem to be wasting your time, but it is deliberate, or at least planned, <laughs> to waste your time um, and to kind of, you know, the, think the about some silly things. The way in which things. we are spending our time is planned. Is planned, yes. So welcome. Um, and uh, we are going to clear... Should we uh, screen save this, though, because it's really good? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, let me do it too, just so that I have my own copy. Your own copy? Okay. Uh, there's an anime, uh, I think it said Psycho Horror, Super anim super Violent. Let me just, I'm on a different screen right now. Yep. If it's anime you're looking for, check out Psycho Pass. Your hunger for gore will be satiated. Oh, yay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Amazing. Please waste my time. <laughs> Please waste my time. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, so just to kind of say something to all of you right now, um, we are now starting physiology. So it means that the midterm coming up on the 13th does not include from today forward. Okay. Just so like, that's where the break is. Monday's class was like the wrap up. And this is now starting physiology, so it is not included uh, in the midterm. The midterm is coming along pretty good. We're actually happy about it. Um, it's looking really good. We're going to simplify again um, and kind of like try to streamline our questions like we did for the other one. So you'll have very few questions in terms of like, you know, the short answer. Um, it'll all be from a bank, so you'll not get the same ones as other people. It'll be in different combinations, and um, it'll be a series of true-false based on some data that we're gonna show you. We're working on the data right now, it's cool. And it's a mix of ecology and evolution, the data. Um, and uh, and then there'll be a bunch of true-false, and you can use the, the data to, uh, determine whether or not the statements that we um, have for you to identify um, are consistent with the data, right? Okay, so it'll be very, very similar to what you've seen before. So the midterm does not include today. It's up until Monday. It Monday. is ecology focused, but... With evolution. We will never forget or ignore evolution. No. So you shouldn't either. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um... Pontypool? That was me. Oh, that's you. Pontypool. Okay. It's a great one. Okay. Um, 
Good. So I think I think that's all we have in terms of announcements. Uh, if you have questions, please throw them in the throw them in chat. I haven't wow, watched Plantipool in forever. People are getting excited about Plantipool. All caps. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Wait a second. Are they shouting? Because Plantipool is transmission via sound, so oh. that could have been an attempt to infect us. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> is there going to be short answers again? Yeah, yes. Same format. So a mix. A mix. Same format. So a bunch of true false and then a bunch of short answer. Um, probably a drawing one or two. We liked that option because it w really allowed us to um, try to um, pull out your answers because what you want to do like for a drawing one, um, a, like the vast majority of you did this, right? You had your drawing and then you had like a little explanation if you wanted to um, or you had like a mix of words and drawings just in case we didn't get your drawing. Um, but you know, we really tried to pull out from your drawings and from your words as much as possible and, and like the more opportunity um, we gave you, the better, the better we were able to do that. And so to like to really see whether or not you understood the concepts. Also, please, Google vocabulary to make sure that you understand which one is which. We um, encourage, like, uh, we were wondering, we were talking yeah. about this last night, because that's what we talk about. Is really? This. Um, <laughs> but we were wondering whether or not you actually bought it or believed it or whether, whether there were so many other courses where you were not allowed to yeah. be open internet. And so in this case, you were thinking maybe I heard it wrong or maybe we didn't mean it and it was a trap somehow this is no admiral akbar it's not a trap it's this is trap. like use the use the interpipes so if the if the question says something about genetic bottlenecks and you're like oh frig i can never keep like that and this uh yeah. this other thing of separated go to the google yeah open a parallel window and go that's this that's this that's right then then build us your that's answer right. That's right. So, um, you know, you, you won't be able to find the answers to our questions on the internet. And that's, if you come across a site that, you know, pretends to like, like have those answers, that's where you're not allowed to go. What, what we okay. ask is, you know, you can go and Google what the words are, but then we want you to devise a scenario and it, that has to come from you. That has to be creative or that has to be like your own original work, right? Synthesis. Synthesis. A couple, um, couple so, of questions yeah. here. Yeah. Final exam date. Oh, have final we Yeah, that? we did. And we have posted it on the announcement. Um, I don't want to get it wrong. Um, we took a look at all of your final exams and when most of you would be writing them. And we came up with a three-day window. Um, Smith is going to scroll uh, to see if uh, if he can find it. I don't want to say it wrong now. So let's let's for sure find it. And then we can like repost it or up it um, to make sure. Um, but yes, we did. And it's going to be like a, a two or three day, three day window that you're going to have. So just like for the midterm, you have a one day window or like eight hour window. Now you're going to have a three day window uh, in which to do our exam. It's going to be exactly the same type of format that you're used to. We want you to like become comfortable with it. So that's something you don't have to stress about and you can just focus on the, the content. It'll be um, physiology heavy herb, but of course we're bringing in evolution and ecology. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and the idea is like to make sure that, you know, we can assess your learning, but to not stress you out. Yeah. So will there be questions about evolution, midterm yeah. one content? Um, it will involve midterm one content. Yes. Will there be questions about midterm one content? I'd say that's no, but it will involve midterm involve, one. Involve. Yeah. 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 You'll, you'll see for midterm yeah. two, what we mean by involving evolution, yeah. Um, but it's really about like the ecology interpretation of the evolution stuff. So you'll we're building layers. You we're building layers. You'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, a yeah. solo thinker. I use the two full hours with a minute left, and somebody else agreed. Mm -hmm. Same. Um, with well, a minute that's left, yeah. That, that's not as you're. That's fine. You're yeah. the thinker. You are. You're the speed. You are. And that the point is that there's that time. I think there is now the uh, suggestion that make sure you do sign in before. 2.30, 2.30, so that you yeah. for sure have the full time and, and the system doesn't time you out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, super. Just on physiology, we've already answered that. Yeah. Um, so no, it okay. Built. It, yeah, uh, I think the final is December 9th to 11th. I think you might be right, but let's We're double check. Looking. We will confirm. <laughs> okay, so physiology. 
Um, welcome to cold places and I get very excited about physiology because we get to talk a lot about the Arctic um, and uh, it is pretty much entirely Arctic focused um, oh I'm gonna sit here and throw in non-arctic uh, yes things throughout though because lots of what's going on in the Arctic I can add a pivot or a caveat or a, a yes and with the tropics and with high elevation stuff in the tropics. Yes. Okay. Yes cool. and. Yes and. Smith will be yes anding throughout. Good. Okay. Here are our learning outcomes. Read them later. One of them's uh, if you go back and read oh. whistle about which zombie movies you want to see. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Okay. So. Final exam details. There we go. You will have from 9 a.m. On December 9th until 10 p.m. on December 11th, 11th to log in. So I will paste that in the chat. Okay. Um, Details in the chat. Thank you to whoever posted it because you were totally right. El Osiers, you get points in life. Yeah. Good. Okay. So just to kind of situate you a little bit uh, within the whole course and where we are, we are layering on physiology. We're not forgetting ecology and evolution uh, and building up, um, but it means a little sort of readjustment in terms of the biological levels of organization that we're going to be talking about and therefore the relevant variables that we need to be talking about. Okay. We need new icons though, because hardly ever will we talk about horses. We will not, and I think they might actually be zebras. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, I can see. Yeah, they're kind of stripy from that the black. Was, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so yes, we need new icons. So, look to Chris Rocky. What is physiology? And so this, <laughs> I still don't know when I have a PhD in physiology. Okay, <laughs> like I have no idea what physiology is like. How things work on a small scale. Is that? Yeah. yeah. I think when we talk about this <laughs> biological scale, so you think about where, where we put the, the hierarchy of biological organization. Yeah. We, so there's some of these things that operate at multiple levels, and some of them are at the interface of some of those levels. And physiology has effects up here, but most of them are down here. And this is where a lot of the things, a lot of the do you deal well with this environment or not? Are you going to be able to move or not move or deal with the bike carrying around? This is about the how and can you within your body the limitations of physiology is your skin <laughs> is like is like the derm of whatever it is right so anything inside an individual um, is is potentially the study of physiology um, it, it yeah I still not a hundred percent sure what the best definition is but it definitely speaks to structure and function of smaller things okay and it and it's, it's really in tied to uh, like the other things, both abiotic and biotic factors. Totally. Maybe the ones that we think about and some of the examples that we'll come up with are explicitly about abiotic factors, but yeah. as you build in and if you build physiology-laden courses into your uh, career, you'll find lots and lots of examples where interactions with others of the same species change your physiology. Yeah, totally. Okay. Biotic. Biotic. So, but now we're thinking about ecology, we're thinking about evolution, we're trying to tie everything in. So we are also thinking about climate change, right? Like big scale stuff on like small scale things. So first polling question for you, I will throw it at you in just a coming second. Um, here we go. Launch polling. Good. <laughs> Is that chemistry midterm? Wasn't there well, a also last election? Week? Yeah. Even just the election, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. We've got about fifty fewer than usual, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go, go, go! Vote, vote, vote! I'm about to close it. Can I say something? Yes. As you share these results. Yes. And one of them is that you've taught this course for much longer than I have. Yes. And I would. L it would be cool if we could have compared results in this particular question yep. through time. Because my yep. impression is that they've changed. 
So actually, what I was going to say yes. is that um, here, yes, so it has changed, um, but, but um, last time we taught this, it was a little bit different than what it is right now. Um, so most of you are saying A and B, um, and that's, that's fine, C, D, E, any of those, totally fine, right? This is your opinion. Um, what, what, what we have seen kind of fluctuate and change is the proportion of, of students who say A versus the proportion of students who say B. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, when I first started teaching this course, it really was predominantly B, um, and actually quite a bit of C. Um, was uh, was also uh, indicated so maybe uh, in 2013 14 15 a lot of B's and C's a lot less a um, and what we're starting to see now is more and more students um, wanting to get involved politically and to take action um, and as as somebody and and you I think I'm speaking for you too as somebody who does do climate or, you know has a climate change theme to their research oh, yeah. um, a lot of us are feeling like we're good on the research like we know that this is a problem we don't necessarily need to continue doing more research to make the case we need to take action um, and as scientists um, and as people, as citizens, we feel, we feel um, you know, a responsibility to also involve ourselves uh, in the politics and, and, and the social justice side of, of, um, of climate change. So it is a political thing. It is a social thing, right? And we can study it scientifically as well. Um, can I so, give you an example of how, how we study it scientifically in my yeah. world, in my brain? Go. We had a couple of papers published this week where we talk explicitly about the climate crisis. We don't talk about change, we talk about the climate crisis because we looked at insects on in cloud forests on tops of tropical mountains to see whether or not they had changed over kind of 20 years. And they have, and not for the better. And that's, and we talk about that, that's to me is science and also political because it's, the things that I work with are literally invisible to most people. And so the changes in those things need to be brought to people's attention to say, it's not just that. And in fact, when you look at big things, sometimes there's a lag in how they change because they can move around better. And the little things are going to be the ones that drop out fast. And so, so that's some of the science that we do yep. that has political overtones. Yep. Um, studying biology in the context of climate change is incredibly revealing about the you know some of the fundamental biology principles of organisms and things like this and so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on um, and I think it's important to acknowledge though that you know things do need to be done uh, if we're interested in you know the future of our experience the human experience on the planet um, for all sorts of reasons some recommendations and sharing of experiences in terms of climate rallies that they've been involved in in the past uh, political involvement yes uh, and it's exhausting and yes and is. so is science and where do you you have to be able to take care of yourself first so that you can do all of the things that you need to or, or choose to do yeah and then the other was a an explicit recommendation of life the Attenborough the BBC life on yes. our planet wonderful on yeah Netflix. super good super good and the Anthropocene another yeah one. Yeah. yeah I mean connecting it to you know everything that's going on in the world right now is is direct it's not even you know secondary effects right we see all sorts of conflicts that arise as a result of dramatic climate changes um, and uh, and the impact that it's had on people in a totally inequitable way right um, we're starting to see refugees environmental refugees that have to abandon islands and in, in you know in Polynesia for example um, and uh, and certainly conflicts uh, violent conflicts that have arisen because of a lack of farming or arable land uh, or, water. or water exactly so yeah. And that, that's to, in our yeah. species, and it's true for literally all, yeah. all of the yeah. others. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we threw another poll at you. <coughs> We're just waiting. All these polls, we have tons of questions for you for the next little while. This is really just about questions. Um, but uh, but hopefully it'll sort of, you know, we start big and then we start to now focus specifically, right? Okay, so we're going to like draw you down uh, into some specific things related, um, related to what we're going to be talking about. Um, taking a look at, uh, at the vote, we've got 82% of you voting in. If you could just, uh, if you're going to vote, get those, uh, get those votes in. And 
Now we're getting you to think about the Canadian Arctic. Um, here we go. Here's where it's uh, where it's headed. So I'll end polling, share results at you. Most people have indicated D, and um, what uh, total destruction of ecosystems, mass extinctions, potentially over the long run. You are not wrong. Okay, um, but first we're going to start to see dramatic changes potentially. So take a look because D is really a list, right? It's like a laundry list of stuff. Um, and um, you can kind of, as we go through the physiology section, you can kind of like tick off what you think um, and kind of go back to, if you indicated D, um, whether or not those things are actually potentially going to happen. Okay. I'll stop sharing results right now and we'll close that because we're moving on. Why? Okay, so now let's think a little bit about sort of more specifics. Using your stamp, um, indicate where you think in the world the greatest changes in average temperature are going to or are currently occurring. Super good. Okay, in the chat, if you have any ideas as to why um, those areas, some people are indicating the equator, interesting. So if you have any ideas as to why, put them in the chat. Albedo. Nice, good. Super cool. Okay, thank Ice you caps. very much. Ice caps melting. Yeah, okay. So it has a lot to do with the physical environment, right? So the answers are the poles. Um, and in fact, looking specifically, what we see is that the fastest warming places are the Arctic and the Antarctic Peninsula. So not the whole Antarctic continent, but that peninsula. And the reason why those two places are warming faster than anywhere else is because of the physical change in those environments uh, being more dramatic than the physical changes in any other environment when you warm it up just like a half a degree or one degree. It's because they're covered with a layer of ice and snow, but relatively little ice and snow, right? Just a few meters, like on the Antarctic Peninsula, um, or in the Arctic. It's just a few meters thick so that a, a small change in temperature will melt that rather quickly, right? On the Antarctic continent, we're talking not just of a few meters, we're talking about 4.6 kilometers of ice and snow at its maximum, right? An average of 2.2 kilometers thick. It's going to take some time. So the, the smaller depths of, um, of, of ice and snow are melting and they're changing color very quickly, right? From a white background to a darker brown or green or gray background, right? And that's going to absorb heat um, a lot more than the white background, which would actually reflect radiation as well. So um, that, that turnover, rapid turnover, creates this positive feedback loop of like warming and warming and warming in a way that you won't quite see at the equator or in temperate environments. Um, so in the boreal forest though, for example, the length of winter where it is covered in snow is decreasing. Um, and so that does over time contribute to warming, but it's going to be a little bit longer because that difference is maybe only a few days on either end of the winter and then a few more days. It's going to take some time before we see these like dramatic changes like we would in the pools. Does that make sense? Yeah. And tell us about mountains. Well, it does. Well, <laughs> I think it's one of the neat things about the people. So those of you who've indicated around the equator is that there is the greatest average changes are in the poles. One of the things about species that live on mountains, is particularly in and around the equatorial, say the, the tropical regions, is that those temperatures, the greatest changes that are happening aren't going to be there. But because those changes are small, and because those areas always have small changes, or nothing but small changes in yeah. temperature, even a small change could have particularly disastrous or large effects. And that's where... Um, 
yeah. one of these questions comes into. But we're actually going to skip a couple of questions. Okay, yeah. super. Good, because we want to talk about polar bears, I think. We'll come back to the other slides, though, in another class. I think it'll be So you don't want to say it now because I want to say it. No, we're not saying it now. Uh, oh. Uh. oh, no, here we go. Skipping, skipping. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> that was just like... <laughs> okay, so we're skipping. All I want to do is talk about that last slide. I know, but we'll get there. I know. We'll totally okay. get there. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about... Turn bio. this lecture around. I want to see that. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to bring those slides back, I promise you. Okay, but we are going to be focusing on the biological effects. Um, after today on, we're totally going to throw social justice and politics at you today. Um, so if that's not your shtick, just hold on. Um, it will get sciency a little bit later, but we do need to acknowledge the effects that uh, a warming Arctic has on the people who live there. Um, the Arctic is like around the world, the Arctic is home to like 30 million people. Um, you know, there are uh, eight or nine sovereign nations that, um, that have, um, you know, people living, communities living in the Arctic, unlike the Antarctic, where there are no communities. So, so this is totally connected um, to, uh, to politics, to society, uh, and to communities, um, and, and has a direct impact on uh, the ability of those people to live the lifestyle um, that they um, they deserve and that they want and that they have been for thousands and thousands of years. Um, climate change has affected the ability of people to travel uh, from one community to another to visit family um, because they were, you know, all of their ways of traveling were, for example, um, across frozen spans of uh, frozen water, um, either with snow machines or with, uh, with dogs uh, or even walking across the ice. And uh, because in the Canadian Arctic in particular, we're losing 14, 15, 16% of our ice cover over the winter, people uh, are disconnected from each other. Um, kind of like we're disconnected from each other because of COVID. Um, imagine that happening, but like on a big scale where, where you can't visit your family for, for nearly as long in the winter. So this is a, this is a real thing. Um, certainly access to food, access to hunting, um, all of those things has, has affected the people that have been living in the Arctic for thousands of years. Are we going to talk to them about, are they going to suggest other effects? Uh, nope. Moving on. Carbon storage. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to be talking about the biology and the biology side of things. The idea is to kind of give you all sorts of information and allow you to be able to make, um, you know, educated guesses or hypotheses about how biological systems will be affected from a physiological perspective. So we're going to, on the online stuff, the asynchronous stuff, we'll talk about plants and all of these things. We're going to be using the polar bear and a few other very cool animals um, to, uh, to kind of get you drawn into thinking from a physiological perspective. And so we need to acknowledge that we are moving down, 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 right? To all of these things, um, the organ systems, the organs, the tissues, the cells, um, and maybe even an atom or two will come up in conversation um, over the next little while. Adam Driver? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> um so some big papers, if you're at all interested in reading, these are optional, uh, but some big ones that kind of bring together big ideas. Um, here's one here on the ecological dynamics. There's a bunch of Canadian authors in there as well, if yeah. you're interested in this. So this is, a, this is a big paper. It's clearly older now. It's 11 years old, um, but uh, many, many, many citations. Yep, and lots of physiology things going on, including some cool stuff. Yeah, and so this was even 11 years ago, right? So, so a long time ago that, that we've seen already measurable change. This is not a debatable thing that over time, as you go on the, that first graph from left to right, you're going from the 90s, the mid 90s to the ends of the knots in the, in the 21st century and looking at the change for many Arctic species. These are like, if you've been to the Arctic, if you're lucky enough to have been there, you've seen some of these uh, flowers and some of these trees. And the time of flowering is increasing, um, it's changing. And that can have a bunch of downstream effects in terms of uh, abandoning your pollinator or making sure that the species that depend on eating you, the herbivores that depend on you, maybe they can't find you anymore. Other changes, many other changes. Some of them include the times of year that the, um, which one was this? This is so changing 
big changes, increases in, in some uh, the population sizes of some things. So and and decreases or alterations in fecundity. These are with caribou, I believe. Yeah. Uh, looking at where species exist. So this is uh, moving up of different uh, sawfly and, and mining species onto plants and shrubs that formerly wouldn't have had them. And so you can, they're plotting kind of the march north of these species from the south that are arriving farther and farther north. And sometimes that results in this example in the bottom with these foxes where the Arctic fox in some cases in the Arctic is being uh, displaced by the vulpes vulpes or the red fox uh, from the temperate kind of lower latitudes and all of these yeah and another big paper um, that uh, it has been uh, circulating quite a bit brings together the ecological and the evolutionary responses uh, in in a super well way this is a pivotal paper that was written and again 2006 like a long time ago that's why we're saying like we don't only need to study climate change now we have to actually fix it like the research has been there for a long time um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Parmesan uh, is an ecologist, very well known, uh, originally from the United States. And the cool thing uh, about her is that recently, yeah. well, a cool thing uh, about her is that after Trump was elected the first time, and hopefully the only time, um, uh, um, Macron in France um, s made a call to climate scientists and said, uh, if you would like to do, because there was a there was a lot of tension as to whether or not climate change research would be able to continue after uh, Trump became president. So Macron in France took this as an opportunity um, to say to anyone, but targeting American scientists, um, if you want to come to France to do climate research, that would be great. Um, and she actually did. Um, so she's she's now uh, in Europe uh, doing climate research there. <coughs> For a little bit longer, she's in terms of the moving plates, tectonic plates of, of culture and science right now. Yeah. When she moved to Plymouth in the UK, it was in Europe. Yes, um, but then, but then has uh, yeah has credentials and adjunct status in in France. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, cool story. There you go. Um, okay, and from that paper, take check this out. Um, these are specific things that have been shown, including the mountaintops that Smith likes so dearly. Um, Range-restricted species, particularly polar and mountaintop species. So this is a direct connection of these two very different, you know, contexts, very different habitats, polar and mountaintop, um, showing severe range contractions, meaning getting smaller, um, and have been the first groups in which entire species have gone extinct. Okay, so think about that for a bit. Um, and think about what, what those sort of similarities might be in terms of the physical environment, in terms of the way that things are changing, um, and how um, truly they are very similar, even though one is about latitude and the other is about elevation. Yeah. Okay, and think about the polar bear in the last 10 minutes that we have. Um, we want to figure out, of course, what is really going to happen to the polar bear. And this gives me the opportunity to show off my photos. So here is a photo from one of my expeditions um, of a beautiful polar bear. And this was taken from the bow of a very small ship. I was the expedition leader of a, of a very small ship, this little tiny kind of like tugboaty thing. It was actually a lighthouse repair ship in other times. Um, and this very small group of um, avid um, photographers hired me to take them as far north as we could get the ship so that they could watch an eclipse. Now, the eclipse was like a big eclipse. It was like a big deal, and they wanted to be as far north as possible to be able to document this eclipse. And I picked a spot at 82 degrees north. Like, this was really pushing it through the ice, and um, it was cloudy for 26 hours and we totally missed the eclipse <laughs> yeah um but anyway not anything that we could really no, do but didn't. it was really unfortunate um and uh the whole arctic was like cloudy so it wouldn't matter where i picked but anyway what was cool was for that day of 26 hours polar bears were walking by the bow of our ship and so they were quite happy actually to get photos like this when we were there though it is 
deeply obvious the connection that polar bears have to ice um, and the fact that they are uh, so intimately tied uh, to the presence of ice. And it has to cause us to wonder what really is going to happen to polar bears in the context of climate change. So please, if you could, open up a browser uh, or on your phone, go to www.menti.com. I'll launch uh, the question for you. The um, code is, I just want to confirm here, 5838671. And we are asking not what you think is going to happen, but what do you need to know about polar bears? So think about like single word variables, right? Um, that um, could be helpful to helping you decide what's going to happen to the polar bear in the context of climate change. Super good. Go on, just fill up that. Yeah, good. I like it. You're gonna swing this back and yeah, in we'll share so everybody can see. Yeah, we have um, we have lots of contributions here. <laughs> That's so good. Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent. Holy moly. Yeah, really good. Good. Good, good, good. Okay. I think we can share this now, um, even though the answers are still rolling in. Doesn't look like they're going to stop. So I, think I know it doesn't. Yeah, let's share. Okay, so here's what it's looking like so far, and it's fabulous. There are, there are so many things, and then there are sort of key things, so they're niche. For sure, yes, and we're going to get to that in a second. Um, their diet and food, so diet and food for you is like the big driving, like what do they eat, where do they get it, that kind of deal. Uh, the habitat, also related to their niche and their diet and their food and all of this stuff, for sure. Um, their adaptations, um, fecundity, reproduction, fertility, I'm seeing all sorts of things related to that. Life cycle, food source, um, breeding, what they eat. So food is like on your minds. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally right. Um, and then all of the other things. So yeah, we, we just need to know a lot about polar bears, right? Um, and it really becomes a question of not only knowing about what they do now, it's understanding those, those like limits of adaptability within an individual, right? So what would it choose to eat? And what could it eat are very different questions. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to learn about all of that stuff yeah. too. And, the, and that's why we're doing this in the physiology unit yeah. because their sensitivity to these changes is in the physiology. Yeah. I also wanted the, most of those things I wanted to point out, most of those things that you need to know in terms of what's going to happen, what do we need to know about polar bears. For many of them, we know things about polar bears and we know things about other mammals and other birds. For by far the majority of the species on the planet, we don't know any of that stuff still. Point made. Good. So let's start looking at range and niche and all of that stuff. Here are because some we do know this with polar bears. Data. So in the chat, take a look at these data. It's a map. Tons of data, right? Tons of things that we can infer about the biology of the polar bear based on these data here, showing you where they could wander through, but where they predominantly are. So the lighter areas versus the darker areas. Based on this distribution, come up with like two things or at least one conclusion that you can make about the, the biology of the polar bear or the needs of the polar bear that will inform or help inform our decisions related to what will happen with climate change. Also throughout there, those of you who are asking about practice questions earlier, this is a kind of practice question. Find a map and a distribution and, and then ask this question. Yeah. Infer stuff. They like to be near the water and ice. Yeah. They need access to land and pack ice in winter. 
they are not as present right on the North Pole. Yet, why are they not? This is good. This is like a total disruptive thing going, what? Like, there are not more of them the farther north you go? That's what Coca-Cola advertisements always taught us. Yeah, and they also hang out with penguins, according to Coke. Uh, Because there's no water. Uh, They need land, big bodies of water and ice, travel long distances, need access to both. Yes. Very good. Okay. So these, these are important things, right? Um, they need access essentially to coastlines, right? They need to be able to come to land um, entirely because they need to reproduce on land. They build the females, build dens. They don't actually hibernate during this time um, because polar bears, the best time to eat is actually in the winter, so there's no hibernation. But the females, when they are about to give birth, do make dens on land in big snow drifts um, so that they can give birth and protect their young. Um, and so they need to do this on land. They cannot do it on the ice. Now, and a couple things about water here, because there's some questions. Why farther south in Canada, but not Russia? Look at the water. Look, look at, at the, the coastline. Water, the coastline. These, are, these are marine mammals. Yes. That, that is literally in their name. If you look at underneath figure one in, the Dero- in Andrew DeRoche's figure, Ursus maritimus, this is the maritime bear. This is the only marine mammal bear, Yeah. right? Um, and uh, they became marine mammals they they're not from marine mammals they are not more closely related to seals but they became a marine mammal by all definition all of their ecology is intimately connected to the marine system but i like there's some other thoughts in here about interactions with brown bears and park yep. that because we're going to come on back to that yeah. right uh, they don't like putin <laughs> um well putin policies are a little bit different too right so that's an important thing to keep in mind i like to read that as protein ah <laughs> okay so intimately connected to the marine system and also need to have access to land all around here the north pole it's a sea it's a it's an arctic ocean there are no islands um above uh, svalbard for example or above uh, ellesmere and greenland um and so all of this area yeah they totally wander through um and wander across uh, or swim, it's totally fine. Um, they can swim for hundreds of kilometers, but um, they need to come back to land in order to reproduce. Like you must have seen them. You you have literally seen them on the ship. Yes. When so you can't 82 see the degrees. Shore. So this yeah. is Svalbard. We sailed out of Svalbard, and then we came up, and then we went to about like about here, and this is 82 degrees, and they were totally wandering by. Yeah. Um, it wasn't uh, in a time where they were super interested in reproducing, right? So they were out foraging. They have huge territories um, that are kind of like a little fuzzy on the edges, right? They like to keep their about, distance. Not just with trees, yeah, but with polar bears But with well. polar bears, yeah. Okay. So more data, because this is really important to be able to critically look at data and infer biological things. So here, uh, what conclusions can we make about these data? Take a look at the x-axis, which is year, uh, and the y-axis, which is the extent of sea ice, right? Millions of square kilometers. So that's basically surface area in the Arctic. Uh, from September 1979 uh, to 2018. Come up with two things that you can say about these data, what they show. Decrease in ice coverage. That's one thing, and it is Sea ice is dropping. Constant fluctuations. Okay, I like that. Uh, Changes seasonally, but is also experiencing long-term decline. Good. Okay, Woodle. Yep, good. What What happened happened in 2012? 2012. What happened in... Oh, yeah. (laughs) 2012, if you remember, 2012 was... And it happened here, too. 2012 was a super warm year. Yeah. And notice how early we've actually been warmer since then, but at that point it was yeah. a super warm year, one of the warmest yeah. we'd experienced. Yeah. Okay, sea ice area has almost halved. Yeah, good. Okay. These are these are true statements. These are great. So you can look at data not only for their trend of decrease, 
but you can also look at data for the variation, like the variability across that time as well, right? So it's not just this blue line that's important or informative, but it's also the pattern, like a, a shorter time periods, right? That there are changes seasonally, that there are fluctuations annually, and that there are periods where it fluctuates very little and periods where it fluctuates a lot more, right? And some hypotheses about the size of variation since 2012 and then uh, yeah. interest in seeing the graph continue towards this year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Okay, good. Here are more data. So now we're not talking about extent. We're talking about the date that the ice breaks up in the year. Um, so day of the year where January 1 is day 1, okay? Uh, and then January 2 is day 2, then 3, 4, 5, all the way to 365 at the end of December. Um, that's called the Julian date, by the way. We use it a lot in biology. Um, uh, it gets us around like the American versus the Canadian way of putting the month or the day forward first. <laughs> you just take the Julian date. Take a look at these data, though. This is the day that the ice broke up uh, between, say, 1980 to 2004. Like, this is old date. These are old data. Um, but what can we say about these? What causes the ice to break up and how is this correlation to the date? Yes, good question. So a lot of things cause the ice to break up. So they can have little breakups as a result of like increasing wave action or wind action coming in that causes the water to move. But generally it's the temperature, the, the air temperature um, that causes the ice to break up. As it starts to warm, the ice gets thinner and thinner, and then the wave action kind of causes it to, to break up. If you get a strong day of wind, for example, that can like cause it to break up and move out a lot faster. Um, but overall, it's sort of the, the sort of interaction between uh, temperature, the driving variable, and then when it becomes a little windier or the water starts to move a little bit more. Yeah. These are all excellent, good, okay. Super good statements. Good, so a graph can tell you so much, right? Um, and now we have to connect it to the biology of our polar bears. So we're gonna end off here today because we are even two minutes beyond our usual time. But we're um, closer to being on time. We're closer we to being on time. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we're going to start tying it into the polar bear. We'll start to talk about, uh, we'll teach you about like some really cool species that you may not think are cool, just maybe like the freshwater mussels where there are some surprising things about them. Um, and, uh, and we'll kind of thread the polar bear through our whole story uh, and end off with the polar bear by the, by the end of this semester. So think about physiology and how it's going to affect other Arctic adapted uh, species. And with that... We will yeah. say so thank you. So we're going to hang around if you want to stick around. Uh, and if not, we'll see you on Monday. And uh, remember those suggestions at the start. Take care of yourself. Find somebody else to take care of. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.